With us on the interview, of course, is Dr. Arthur Robinson, who is president and research professor at the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine. Uh, this is Marty Stacy, communications director, with a special guest, John Saxon. Dr. Robinson, I know you've been impressed with the Saxon math program. Why do you feel this is so important for uh, this time in history? Well, mathematics is the language of science, the language of science and engineering. Uh, science and engineering are essential to our society and civilization. It's essential that our children learn this language. And uh, the Saxon program is the best possible way of learning it that I'm aware of. John Saxon's also an unusual uh, man. I, I think people are going to enjoy this interview. I think they'll enjoy it a great deal. John Saxon, describe uh, for the benefit of the listeners uh, a little bit about your uh, academic and professional background before you got involved with uh, mathematics in such an intensive way. Well, uh, first place is, uh, it might be considered unusual, I don't like math. Uh, the math all, they, when the math class, they always made me feel inadequate. Uh, and it went on for years and years and years, and I didn't have a very good attitude. But uh, having a good vocabulary, being able to speak the English language, knowing math and knowing some science and knowing history are crucial to getting along uh, in our technological society. And uh, I, the third time, I didn't have a very good attitude. The third time I took trigonometry at the University of Georgia, my father encountered Dr. Strawn on the street. And he said, Dr. Strawn, how is John doing in trigonometry this time? And Dr. Strawn said, Mr. Saxon, John's smart enough. And he make he could make an A if if he would only come to class. But he's already he's only allowed four cuts a quarter, and he's already had five. And if he cuts more one more time, I'm gonna cut him out. And my father came looking for me, and I'm I'm very pleased that he did not kill me when he found me. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, I made an A that time, and then I got uh, because he gave me the math background. I got to go to West Point. And I graduated from West Point. Uh, I was a B-17 pilot in World War II. Uh, right after my father uh, I took a trig a third time, I was went into the Army Air Corps in 1943, and I was a B-17 driver in World War II. I didn't get overseas. And then I got an appointment to West Point, uh, and I took calculus, and I made two Ds. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I was so poorly prepared and the other reason I didn't have a, a good attitude. But this is, is a very important, this part that I'm telling you now, uh, the fact that I was not interested in, because we have a lot of John Saxons in our schools. And I am living proof that these students have potential, the ones who believe they don't like math and that are not doing well in math. And, uh, because I can attribute to mathematics all of the successes I had in life. I graduated from West Point, and then they said, if you have a no, know enough math, we'll send you to test pilot school, uh, and uh, you will send you to get a degree in aeronautical engineering, and then you can go to test pilot school. And I did. And I loved being a test pilot. I was a test pilot for five five or six years for the Air Force, and it was it was just the ultimate. And then I got too old for that, and I got a master's degree in electrical engineering, and I taught electrical engineering at the Air Force Academy for five years. And after I retired from the Air Force, I got a job teaching in mathematics in an Oklahoma Junior College, and I was distinguishedly unsuccessful. And so I set out to try to find out uh, why. And uh, the it turned out that in our math, we teach math with flashcards. The, uh, we, we show them, for instance, let's take percent. Uh, we teach it in hunks. We'll teach a percent for a week in the eighth grade. Uh, then uh, they come up to the ninth, and then they don't discuss it after that week. Then in the ninth grade, we do it for two weeks. They don't remember anything from the eighth grade. And then in tenth grade, we give them geometry. And use geometry as a wedge to drive off the unfit and make everybody else uh, forget the algebra that they know uh, and percent and all the rest. And then we don't teach percent in the 10th and 11th grade uh, because it's a lower division topic. And our kids graduate from high school and they don't know percent, they don't know this, they don't know that, they don't know anything else. The, the math books that are out there are, are just a total disaster. 
Art, you've had some uh, experience teaching at the uh, college level. Uh, your observations in this regard? Well, I taught freshman chemistry at the University of California, San Diego, and the students are, were exceptionally poorly prepared in uh, mathematics. And then, of course, we have our home school here, which uses Saxon math, and they're excellently prepared. Well, you see, my, my, my taking chemistry and physics and all of those things was total trauma because I did not have the mathematical preparation necessary to let me concentrate on the chemistry and physics. I was dumb puzzled uh, by the math, the little bit of math that was required in those courses. So, so what did you do here at the uh, j uh, junior college? Did you decide to uh, rectify this whole situation? No, I, I didn't think you could do anything about it, but all good teachers try. You know, they say, ooh, that sounds like a good idea. I think I'll try that next year. Oh, that sounds like, and everything, you you try anything because you cannot accept total failure. And so one time I was sitting in my office, and I said, John, they can pass the first test, the second test, the third test, and the fourth test, but they can't pass the final because the time they get to the final, they've forgotten everything that happened on the first three tests because we don't talk it again. I said, the only thing that I care about is the final examination. What would happen if all we did uh, all uh, or the whole, for the whole course was practice for the final? What would happen if we practiced everything every day? And he said, John, he said, pretty soon you would have uh, 150 uh, problems in every on every homework problem set. And I said, maybe not. And he said, yes, you would. And I said, maybe not. And he said, yes, you would. He said, hush up, John. I've got to work. <laughs> uh, and so, so I hushed up. And uh, then I turned around and started to work. And he said, but you could only have two or three of the new kind, for, and, it, and there wouldn't be enough of them for them to get it. And I threw back my head and roared. I said, they don't get it now. That's the reason I'm trying something different. And so what I set up, oh, in, in essence, is what I've discovered or what I have developed is we, uh, have, we, we have a little bit of something new every day, and then we practice every, then we have 26 or 27 review problems, and we practice everything we've done before. And uh, then tomorrow we'll have another something new, and they won't remember what they did yesterday to date tomorrow, but then we'll have to review that again, because what I want to do is I want a book that where they can pass a test of reasonable depth in every topic in May. And then, uh, I, the first time when I finished my Algebra 1 book, they had done a percent problem and a ratio problem of a reasonable degree of difficulty every night for three and a half months in the Algebra 1 book. And I said, by golly, they've got it. And in next the, and then I gave a class of them a test in September, and half of them had never, heard, had never heard of either topic. They had been able to wipe their minds clean over the summer, and they had done one every night for three and a half months. And so then I said, well, we can't follow Algebra 1 with geometry. We've got to have another year of work on percent and ratio and everything. And then we had transfer students come in. And so I said, well, we're going to have to review everything in the Algebra 1 book rather quickly in the first 20% of the Algebra 2 book. And while we introduce new topics and then we continue it going. And I found out that you have to, that you can teach Algebra 1 pretty successfully in two years. At the end of the Algebra 2 book, the kids can work all of the problems in the Algebra 1 book with absolutely no difficulty. Art, any uh, observations from your professorial background there? Oh, what? <laughs> well, he was asking me. The, uh, he's quite right. You have to work for the final exam because the point is that uh, langu uh, mathematics is the language of science. When you get to real science courses, if you don't speak the language, you're out of luck. He's making sure that you know that language. Yeah. Yes, and what we found out is that many kids are like I am, I like I was. They're just not interested in math. They're interested in what he said, what she said then, what you're going to do Saturday night. Oh, did you see that? 
and they have short attention spans, and the only way that they can be taught the math that they need to succeed in chemistry and physics and in a high-level math course is through a long-term process of general repetition. And if you're going to practice, you better be sure you're practicing fundamentals. You don't have time. The football coach knows that if you don't move, move before the ball is snapped, you can block and you can tackle then you're going to win some football games. So that's what he concentrates on. He concentrates on the fundamentals that are necessary for success. And then you say, but coach, when do you do flea flickers and end arounds and fake field goals and all things like that? He says, the afternoon before the game when we were in shorts uh, and, and we're not doing contact, uh, we don't have time to practice things that are not fundamental during the regular practice sessions. Hmm. Have, have you dealt with the process that you kind of uh, indicated there? The kids seem so distracted from uh, academics. Well, there's, 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 yes, but well, we've had great success. Every school system, every school system that has used our books uh, has doubled academic senior math enrollment, triple calculus enrollment, and reduced the number of kids on the, taking dumb dumb math courses like basic math and consumer math by over 50%. And you know the Bible says, uh, there's a parable in the Bible, maybe you can tell me, it said, uh, that ends with these words, and all these things were added unto him. You remember hearing those words in the King James Version of the Bible? <laughs> I, I remember that. I, I, think, I think it was in the parable of the talents. And all of these things are added unto him. And all of these things have added unto me. Because uh, what they do is I give the, what we do is we do it again and do it again and do it again. And, of course, we change it a little bit. We change John to Frank and Harry to Mary and Watkinsville to put to Petonkville or whatever it is. We change the wording, but we continue practicing. The problems continue practicing the basic concepts. And every day we ask them 28 of the problems they know how to do, 20 of the problems they can do just almost by snapping their fingers. And so in this method, when we have this long-term practice, I continually ask the kids to do uh, things they know how to do, and they get to show off. And the standard book every day concentrates on something new, and they're off balance, and they're frightened. And when in my books, the teachers, I've had two or three teachers tell me that they came in, say, in uh, January or whenever it was, and they said, well, we're not going to take the test today. We're going to put it off till, till Monday. And there was an uproar because after you've been taught it and after you've practiced it for a long time, the kids look forward to the test because they get to show off. And this was added unto me. I said, I'll beat it into the little boogers. They said, won't they be bored? I said, I'm not running an entertainment show. They're going to do it. They're going to do it. It's the long-term practice. And I didn't know they would like it. Because when you do long-term practice, then you're doing things that you know how to do. And they get to show off when they do the homework, and they get to show off when they take a test. That sounds like a kind of a revolution uh, in or reformation, maybe I should say, in social structure of schools. Oh, yes. One of the things we've had to do is we have a year of geometry in high school, and the kids study the year of geometry, and then they come out and they're real shaky, and they've forgotten everything within 18 months. And so in our series, we do the geometry every night for four years. And at the end of the time, it's firmly embedded in their long-term memory. It's just like a signpost on the way to grandmothers. They'll never forget it. Dr. Robinson, you have any uh, perspective here? No, he's he's right. He's done. The, the, uh... Dr. Robinson, what I'm doing is I've written a physics book. Yeah, and... my son has already finished your physics book. Oh, he has. One of my sons, my second son. Oh, you're using them yourself. You know then that he has a real, real good foundation in physics. Yeah. Well, what we we uh, uh, we've had. My wife got your sex and physics books with the plan to use them in our home school. Yes. Uh, but then she died six years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. And at that time, the children, the oldest boy was 12, and there was a boy 10, and a girl 8, and twins 6, and a little boy one and a half years old. And I uh, didn't have time to be their teacher, but I just set them up with a class 
classroom, and I made your math series the central thing in their teaching. In other words, six days a week, uh, 12 months a year, when they get up in the morning, they do a lesson in your math books. Yes. Work their way through the series. The first, uh, and I was pleased, at first they, when I first started them, after Laura Lee's death, there was a fairly high error rate, but I was pleased that the error rate dropped, and we made a rule that if they missed a problem, then they had to show it to me, and then they had to go and, and uh, fix it themselves. And they would grade, they checked themselves to make sure that they've worked the problems correctly. Well, the uh, oldest boy finished your calculus books at about 16. My goodness. And then uh, your physics book wasn't available then. Yes. So I gave him uh, the freshman physics books from Caltech for yes. school. And I was astonished. Uh, he had not only learned the math he needed uh, to do this, but his brain had got used to the idea that given a problem, it could solve it. Yes. So he went right into college level physics books that were never intended to be entirely self-teaching without any instructor, and he did just kept right on solving problems. So then I gave him... Well, may I interrupt here, and I want you to continue the story. Right. The standard math books by the major publishers, do my, the major focus in my books is to building a, a repertoire of problems uh, that can be solved by using particular concepts. And the the problems in my books are designed to teach the concepts and concept recognition. And to lead to the result that your child found, I have taught him the basic problems and the basic concepts and the basic skills necessary for solving all problems. I understand that. And uh, I, I, so I gave him uh, the freshman chemistry book I used at the University of California. He worked his way through that. But uh, you're right about problem-solving skills, and i show you one final illustration. When I was a f at Caltech, there was a dean there named Strong who had, over the years, collected the toughest me uh, Newtonian mechanics problems, physics problems, from the final examinations. Yes. And it was ordinary to put in something in the finals that nobody could work. You know, they yes. didn't want the Caltech students to think that they knew it all, so they always had some problems in there. The these are ordinary uh, uh, Newtonian mechanics problems, but they have—they're tricky, and they—and they're—and they're involved. And he had selected collected these problems. There were 140 problems, and we we knew them as strong problems after the dean who collected them. And they gave us uh, the Caltech freshmen. They gave us a set of those problems and a set of answers. And they didn't require us to do anything. They said, if you have any spare time, you might try some of these. There was one student on the campus who was legendary because it was rumored that he'd actually worked the strong problems. So Zachary's, because of your math, had done so well in these other things, and he was getting kind of a big head, and I said, well, I'll show you. And I dug out those strong problems and gave them to him, and he's working those with about a 10% error rate, 90% correct. And I'm convinced that this is because you've done exactly what you say. You have taught problem solving and taught it beautifully and when the child reaches the age of 17, 18 years old he can work any problem of, of that sort and the same thing's happening with his brother who's now 16 <laughs> we have an, one oddity which would be interesting for you to comment on because the children do uh, this uh, every morning and because our plan is uh, our, our school works 6 days a week 12 months a year uh, even though they go through all of your books, uh, the ones that started earlier run out of material earlier. And we have now a 16-year-old who's finished your physics book, a 14-year-old girl who's finishing your calculus book, and her 12-year-old sister is going to finish your calculus book at 13. They're running out of books. Well, I would have written a chemistry book, but I don't know any chemistry, but I have an author. Uh, Ph.D. from the University of Texas uh, over here at the University of Oklahoma, and uh, in, in two days uh, I'm going to start on the chemistry book, and I'm going to write the first five or six lessons, which will include all the chemistry that I know. And then she is going to write the lessons, and we're going to do the homework problem set, because uh, the I, I think your, your younger kids found physics quite quite reasonable, didn't they? 
Well, yes, and the remarkable thing is that even at an early age, going through your series and doing everything in your books, even 13-, 14-year-olds can complete your calculus book. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. When I wrote my first book, uh, I, I could read it. And I had never been able to read anybody else's math book. And I'll tell you how I explained that to myself, that my, I could read my book. I said, John, you're not smart. And what you have done is written books uh, for people who are not smart because the math is not difficult and the physics is not difficult. And I really believed that for a long time. But uh, I, I, I am not brilliant. I don't think I'm as smart as any of your kids. But it is possible to teach these things that have been so poorly taught in the past so that anybody who will do the work can learn them. Uh, yes, and I think you're teaching more than math. Uh, I think you're teaching kids how to think because their performance in other subjects besides math is, I think, far better because they're doing your math text. I, I don't think I can... Teach them how to think. That's teaching divergent thinking. That's teaching uh, Einstein uh, how to think. I, I can't do that. But I believe that I can teach productive thought patterns. That's what I mean. And that will trigger a, a particular response, and it will give them a starting point to 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 work the problems. And uh, the the in the back of the physics book. Uh, I, I had worked for a long time on relativity. I could not understand it at all. And then uh, I had a graduate assistant helping me to do that. He was working on a doctor's degree in electrical engineering. And he showed me about local simultaneity, the difference between local simultaneity and distant simultaneity, that thought process that Einstein developed for his uh, for, for his first step in relativity and it, it was it was not it was not difficult at all and i was just amazed and thrilled that that i could follow einstein's uh basic thought patterns uh, uh for his relativity now of course some of the advanced stuff is just leaves me <laughs> it leaves me cold because i no one has been able to explain it to me uh in in manner in a manner that i could understand what do you, uh, gentlemen, think about talking about uh, the, the learning theory behind Saxon math art? Does that sound like a good subject next? Well, surely he's been talking about it, but yeah. have him talk about it some more. Yeah. Well, I, I have something, Art, and uh, that, that I've never written any of this down, but I found out that forgetting, that learning, if you learn something, it means that you can recall it. If you need it, you can recall it. And I have found out through this thing that I've done with the books that forgetting is an integral part of learning. The concept does not come from the teacher's mouth. It's the starting point, and you design a little problem at this level on the concept and have the student work the little problem. And the next day, they will look at the problem and they'll draw a blank. And so you have to help them recall it. And so they strain and they strain, oh, yeah, okay, okay, and then they do it. And then the next day they have to recall it, and they still have difficulty, and sometimes they have difficulty for a long period of time. But the, if they're given a lot of practice and allowed to forget it and then recall it and then forget it and then recall it and then forget it and recall it, sometimes they have to be helped on a concept every day, say, for 10 days or for a particular problem. But by that time, they will read the problem again, and they'll reach up, and they'll try to recall, and, and they're able to recall it. But the thing that I have discovered is if you stop at this point, the ability to recall it will fade away. And what Dr. Benjamin Bloom at the University of Chicago, he is the guru of, uh, of learning for America, he says that your first task is to attain mastery. Then what he says is you must do real long-term practice beyond mastery, which allows you to automate concept recognitions and the skills necessary to do a particular work or problem that requires the use at a certain level. And when you have automated this and you can do it automatically, 
without thinking. It frees the mind to consider the problem at a higher cognitive level. And then you can work on automating the same concept at the higher cognitive level. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. A lot of sense. What is your uh, observation, uh, John Saxon, uh, after the years now that you've seen students taking the math? Is is there a uh, uh, paradigm shift in the way math teachers are looking at things? I don't know. They, they, what they're doing, the math teachers in America, uh, are going along with the untested recommendations of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. You see, the mathematicians have a society called the American Mathematical Society. If you have a doctor's degree in mathematics, uh, you belong to the American Mathematical Society, and they are interested in inventing new math and pushing back the envelope. And uh, most of them uh, are so far out, the real mathematicians, as far as I'm concerned, it takes them an hour and a half to get back to left field. Uh, they, they, they're way out in Never Never Land. And the people who can't handle that, they get a bachelor's or a master's degree in mathematics, and then they run down to the School of Education and take 60 hours of show and tell and become doctors, doctors in math education. And these people are, are noted for the fact that they have never produced any original problems, them solved any original problems themselves. And, but somehow or another, they feel that they have been given the gift of teaching students how to the art of solving problems, in spite of the fact that they haven't been able to demonstrate this art themselves. And it all started with the new math. Now, the new math was in the 70s, and there was a professor named Bagel. He was a mathematician at the University of uh, uh, at Yale University, and there was a uh, they they had. Started these committees of real mathematicians to see if there wasn't a way, better way to teach math. And about that time, the Russians launched the Sputnik, and then the cry went up: the Russians are getting ahead of us. The Russians are getting ahead of us, and we're going to have to do that. And so these mathematicians went together and threw together some of the things that they thought would help us, and it was the foundation of the new math. Now, they said when they started out that they didn't know anything about teaching lower-level math, uh, and so they were paired with a high school teacher. Every one of them was paired with a high school teacher, and the high school teacher was supposed to be able to tell them what the students were able to comprehend. But the high school teacher is not going to argue with a theoretical mathematician, and so they came up with this thing called the new math. And then the mathematicians went back to being mathematicians, and they left it with the math educators. And they came forth with this national drive uh, to teach these things that had never been tested before, and it didn't work. And it lasted for 10 years. Then the math educators said, well, what should we do now? This is not working. And so they came up with a document called the Agenda for the 80s. And one of the things the Agenda for the 80s came up with, it says we're going to put calculators in every elementary school in America. We are going to uh, uh, reduce the emphasis on what we've taught in the past. So they ran that for 10 years, and that didn't work. Now they have the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, which is the organization for people with, with degrees in math education. Uh, they have come up with a document called the Standards, and they have decided to reemphasize the cal use of the calculators in elementary schools. They are going to de-emphasize the teaching, the addition and subtraction fact. They are going to greatly de-emphasize the, uh, the, the teaching of long division, and the disaster is going to get worse and worse and worse. And the reason is, is that the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics never test any of their theories before they're forced on an unsuspecting nation. They say, we have gotten together, five or six or seven or eight of us, and this is what we suggest, and then a whole nation is required to go with it. And so this is the reason that my books have uh, b been used primarily in small schools where the teacher can go to the principal and says, I'm not happy with what my kids are learning. Can I try the Saxon books? And she, she said, yes. And the teacher finds that they work. Now, when you get to a big school system like a metropolitan school system or a big suburban school system, 
the math is run by the math educator, somebody in that department, in that school, who has a doctor's degree in math education. And they have been taught how to think by these math educators, and they are greatly influenced at the national level uh, by, by, by the latest fads suggested at the national level. And the, the, this organization uh, says that I don't know what I'm doing. They, they don't know the difference between drill and practice. And they think, they claim that what I'm doing is my mindless drill, whereas if you talk to the teachers who have used it, they will say that, the, that, that, that that's the last thing I'm doing is my mindless drill. It's long-term practice. And so the math teachers in America are not allowed to go out and find books that work uh, because the Saxon books are really, uh, uh, I hate to use the word, but it's, it's very understandable, bad mouth by the members of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. They said, I am not teaching higher order thinking skills. I am not teaching students how to solve original problems. And the way that you teach solving of original problems and high-order thinking skills is to build a tremendously firm foundation on which the students can stand uh, and reach from this firm foundation for higher understanding. Hard, my observation in, in listening to you and to uh, John is that it seems that mathematics is a known science. There's a finite number of facts that a student needs to know. It, it looks to me, in, in a way, like we've been unwilling to come to grips with that. Well, well the, the mathematicians will tell you that this is not true. It's not a finite science. And uh, I, I tend to agree with them. But I think there are uh, a, a not finite number of basic skills. There are a large group of basic skills that we know uh, and basic concepts that students must understand in order to go higher. I don't believe that math, we, well, arithmetic, I don't even believe arithmetic is finite. And the, the, uh, I have the young man who is, a, uh, who is the president of my company, Frank Wang, uh, has a doctor's degree in theoretical math from MIT. And I can't even discuss with him the things that he works with. Uh, and he and all the real mathematicians in the country are working on concepts that I, that I that they can't even explain to me what the problem is, much less how to work it. Art, your observations? Well, yes. And you see, in science, uh, science moves along. These ma theoretical mathematicians are out working in areas that are not relevant to physical science at the present, but that math will be ready when physical science gets there. The, the advance of physical science has gradually used the math that the theor theoretical mathematicians developed at a time when there was no use for that math. So the, and they don't know whether it's going to be useful when they invent it. Right. So the theoreticians are out there working on something, as to, but the, the important thing is that these people who are in science and engineering and want to live in a technological age can understand the math required to understand the age they live in and to advance that. And uh, this this uh, new concept for the 90s you just mentioned, the, the calculators and the de-emphasis of arithmetic, I know that's a disaster. I, I've known many outstanding physical scientists. One of the characteristics by which they recognize each other, because there are a lot of people who are, say they're scientists, but they really aren't. They're not much good at their subject. But the way that first-rate uh, uh, scientists often recognize each other is by their speed at mental arithmetic. I'm just talking about multiplication, division, subtraction. The idea that you, you can't put a calculator in your head and you can't think quantitatively if, unless you can do rapid mental arithmetic. I just, uh, day before yesterday, uh, uh, Martin Kamen, who was the discoverer of carbon-14, we went up to Oregon State University where he gave a lecture on nuclear physics and the discovery of carbon-14. That lecture was filled with instances where Kamen was doing rapid mental arithmetic uh, during the lecture and doing it uh, orally. You know, he'd do it verbally so the people in the lecture hall could follow this uh, without uh, being able to, to multiply, subtract, add, and divide rapidly in your head. You couldn't have followed his lecture. 
but there was nothing more than arithmetic in in that. Dr. Robinson, are you familiar with Richard Feynman? Did you read Genius? Uh, no, but I heard Richard Feynman. I knew him a little bit. Oh, you did? A lecture on the new math. Oh, my goodness. And you're, uh, I heard him give a lecture on the new math when it was prevalent uh, uh, years ago. And uh, through some quirk, uh, Feynman was put on a committee in California to evaluate new math textbooks. Oh, I read about, I read his book on that. And the, the lecture was just hilarious because he starts out pointing out that the books were full of stuff that he'd never had to use, and he didn't know why the kids needed it. And then he started on the teaching method. It, it's just the, the new math, of course, was a disaster, and Feynman very humorously explained why while it was going on. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, the essential thing is to understand the fundamentals and build on that as you do. And as I say, I've seen these students here in our home school. They can work top-level physics problems because you gave them a good fundamentals. But if I had given them calculators when they were in grade school... They wouldn't be able to do anything. Let them use computers when they were 12. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do anything. They'd be... Well, the, the National Council of Teachers of Math says we are the technology is here. Now, this is the reasoning. Uh, the, the technology is here. Uh, the calculators are here. The computers are here. Therefore, we should use them. <laughs> well, tuberculosis is here. <laughs> right. They don't recommend tuberculosis. They don't recommend venereal diseases. There, there are a lot of things that here, and the fact that they are here, and they are very valuable. It's, it's ridiculous for you in chemistry to have a big numerical problem to have to sit down and grind it out with pencil and paper. My wife was a systems programmer, and I've used the best computers I could get my hands on for 30 years in my work. At this time, in this little research lab, we have eight computer systems. And I won't let any child touch one of those computers until he's finished your calculus course. Well, I, then he has the background that he can understand what is going on. Well, at least the ca computer can't get in the way of his learning. Yes. Do the things his mind needs to know how to do. But we are, we are having a disaster in America. Everybody is doing what the, all the public schools, most of the public schools, are doing what the National Council of Teachers of Math says to do about calculators. And you, the, the disaster that they are creating is becoming more and more apparent in the 8th and ninth grade. They are arithmetic illiterate. I write a newsletter, and I wrote in the newsletter recently uh, words to the effect that uh, uh, some American kids were doing okay in spite of the school system, but it was too bad to burden them with this. One of my former graduate students who teaches at the university called me up and he says, I don't agree with what you wrote. And I said, well, why not? And he says, well, you said some of the kids were doing all right. You haven't been teaching in the university for a long time. You don't know what I have to put up with. Then he started talking about the math skills of the kids in his uh, introductory chemistry courses. They don't have any. They don't know third, third grade math. They can't no. do anything. It's, it's, it's a disaster, and the members of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics talk all the time about the standards, how they are going to do away with the necessity for doing arithmetic. They are going to teach high-level thought process. They are going to do all of these things, and all of it, well, it, it, it sort of reminds you of the communists. They believe that you had to destroy a society in order to build a perfect society, and they have destroyed Russia and Eastern Europe and it'll take them 100 to 200 years to recover from the destruction. I'm just beside myself. I'm going to be 71 years old on 10th of December, and uh, uh, there's nothing I can do about it. All any one of us can do is light our own candle. You've done a tremendous amount. And, you know, uh, aside from these school systems that are using your books, uh, the homeschool movement is growing like wildfire. And practically every homeschooler I talk to is using your books. Yes. That that is a uh, very rapidly growing movement, and your books are are very well suited to it because they're self teaching, so that they you can put those in a home, and whether the parents know math or not, the kids learn it. Well, if the parent will work with the child, the parent will learn the math along with the kid. It's not hard. Perhaps. <laughs> uh, the, uh, they consider work. Many kids consider like work like that misery. And misery loves company, and the parents 
have to get, if, if the student is not wildly enthusiastic and doing it on own, the, the parents have to do what my mama did with me. I remember when I was in the second grade, she, she backed up my education all along by saying that I did my homework, and she was teaching me to spell. And she says, spell cat, and I said C-A-T, and she said, spell us. And I said, I don't know how. She said, U.S. I said, U.S. She said, say it again, U.S. She said, spell rat. I said, R-A-T. She said, spell us. I said, I just did. <laughs> and then we went around, and she came back to us about seven times. And she wasn't getting my attention. And we, I lived at 201 South Court Street in Quitman, Georgia, and this was in about uh, 1931. And last year I was back there, and I went back to that room, and I asked the lady if I could walk in the house where I spent uh, my four years. I was from the fourth, four years old to four, first grade to eighth grade, and she said yes. And I went back there, and I could pick out the places on the floor where the two parts of the pencil broke uh, when my mother broke it over my head for, for, for not being able to spell us about the tenth time she asked me. <laughs> she just broke that pencil over my head, and then we kept working on spelling us. Uh, John, I tried respectfully to to read your critics. It, it looks to me like they're not tremendously fond of reading the research. Well, what they want to do is read uh, research is done in a school of education, you know, and coming out with, with statistically significant. Now, every school... I'll give you an example. Hillary Clinton's high school is Main East High School in suburban Chicago. Six years ago, they started using my books. At that time, they had two sections of calculus. This year, they have ten sections of calculus, and their college board scores for this huge suburban school system is up 19%. Now, this is not a nice Jewish neighborhood in a real select area of North Shore and Chicago. This is a multi-ethnic neighborhood. And they have been able to go from two sections of calculus to ten sections. And this is really extreme, but most of the schools have been able to triple their calculus enrollment. Uh, that one went, school went up by five times. And we have schools like uh, Wheatland, Wyoming. Uh, they have 100 kids in the senior class this year. They have 25 in calculus. And if we can do that all over the country, we can save our country from being purchased by the Japanese. Talk about your philosophy of monkey see, monkey do. Well, this turns out this is another thing that they say that I'm only doing blind line this road, but kids learn which words are bad words and which words are good words by saying them. And when they say the bad words, they get wrapped in the bottom and they say, don't say that again. And most of the things kids learn is they repeat the things that they have heard and they repeat things that they have seen. And uh, many times they don't know why they why you should do it that way. And the math educators say that you should teach the child to, quote, understand, unquote. And they keep talking at the child and telling the child the theory why it will work, why it works, and the child does not understand. And therefore, the child is unable to do. Well, what I do is I take the problem, the concept that I want to teach, and build it into a little problem. And then I teach the child how to work the problem. And, uh, Doctor, you, you probably had this happen to one of, I know it happened to any number of times to your kids, a kid would, a child, one of your children would have been doing something for about three months, and they really didn't know what they were doing, but they knew this was the way to do it. And after a long time, they say, "Oh," and you say, "Now do you understand?" They said, "Yes, look." And 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 the understanding of many of the concepts, which are abstractions, comes after using the concepts for a long period of time. This is exactly right. When I went to Caltech, the first lecture that they gave us, uh, one of the main principles they taught was if you don't understand it, memorize it. Memorize it and use it 
eventually you'll understand it. It's, it, it. And this is anathema to educators. That, that's exactly right. And they I, said, we don't want to teach the children. In fact, we don't want to have a memorizing. Sometimes you memorize things you don't understand. I'd, I'd like to give you a real good example. Uh, in Athens, Georgia, in 1940, I was in Miss Ruby's, Miss Ruby Anderson's English class, and she made me memorize the last stanza from Milton, the blind, blind poet's poem, Thanatopsis, which Thanos is the Greek word for death, and Thanatopsis is on death. And Milton's last stanza, if I can recall it now, uh, it says, So live that when, I don't have it exactly right, but I have pretty close. So live that when thy summons comes to join the innumerable cavern that winds through the silent halls of death, go not like a quarry slave scourged to his dungeon, but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust, lie down to pleasant dreams. I didn't know what I was memorizing, but then, but I do now. Well, I've I've had the experience in science all my life that uh, I will uh, use a concept for a long time, and it may be. 10 or 15 years after I learned that, that I'm explaining it once again to somebody and I finally understand it. I'll never forget my favorite story. Can I tell another one, please? Please. I was teaching a second semester, second year course in electrical engineering at the Air Force Academy. And it required the use of partial differential equations. And I said, the partial of this with respect to that, delta that, plus the partial of this with respect to this, delta this. And I was writing it on the board, and I got the first three partials written. And I looked up at the board, and I said, it's true. I said, all that partial is, in this case, is a constant. And then I explained it to the kids, and I was flabbergasted. I had done partial differential equations for two semesters at the University of Oklahoma, and I had taught the course for two semesters at the Air Force Academy, and I didn't realize what it was. And then all of a sudden, I saw it. This whole idea basically sets a current educational procedure on its head. It's real difficult to understand. The people who are doing this are good people. They want to do good. And they don't believe how they are damaging our children by denying them this, uh, uh, the memorization of the facts and the concepts and the skills necessary to build a firm foundation to stand on to reach high. They really think they are good people. And uh, I'm sure that God loves them, but I don't. <laughs> And you don't have, it's important to understand, Marty, we don't have two competing ideas here uh, that are competing in a vacuum. Just leaf through these results from the schools that have used Saxon math. The, uh, the, these are not little increases in SAT scores. These are enormous increases. The effects are... Uh, <laughs> they said, is it statistically significant? I said, in Sylvania, Georgia... It's a county school system, the Scriven County School System, that high school in Sylvania, Georgia, used the Saxon math books, and the algebra enrollment increased 106%. That meant that it more than doubled. They, 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 they had 87 students one year, and twice, uh, twice 90 is 180. They had more than 180 students the next year. Uh, not, not the next year. It took them three years to do it because the effect is cumulative. And this is happening in schools all over America. And until the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics comes up with something that's better, they say, don't use Saxon Hill, double your advanced math enrollment, increase your college board scores. But that doesn't count because he's not teaching understanding. <laughs> Yeah. I, I was I was in uh, I was in uh, I was in Charleston, West Virginia, two weeks ago at a regional meeting of National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, 
And I had had an appointment with the president uh, last year of the National Council, and she wasn't able to keep it, and I had, we hadn't rearranged it. And so she came down by my booth, and I called her name, and I said, come here, I said, let me show you something. And she looked at me like I was the most evil thing that you had ever seen, and she just skittered off sideways <laughs> like a crab. And this is the last president of the National Council of Teachers of Math is even afraid to talk to me because I'm so contaminated. <laughs> well, the, the, the bottom line is that you've created something that they can't create, and it's doing a better job than what they did, and this well, is... Uh, well, you see, I don't have a degree in math. I don't even have a degree in education. That's possibly the easiest degree to get. I'm an outsider, and uh, it's real funny. You remember in ancient times that Many kings would kill the messenger who was bringing bad news. And that Hans Christian Andersen told us that in his fairy tale, uh, uh, something that's accepted in all society, that only a child is allowed to say the emperor is wearing no clothes. Okay. And I say that we have been teaching math wrong and that I can prove it and use my books, and we can double the uh, algebra, uh, we can double advanced math enrollment in any school, raise the college board scores in math in any school 20%. Now, that's a minimum. In Hennessy, Oklahoma, they started using my books. They raised the college board scores in math 49%. Then the two teachers that had been teaching the math in Hennessy High School retired. They got in two more teachers. They threw the Saxon books out, and now they're right back to where they were before. And this, this happens, unfortunately, all over the country. Art, we, we haven't said this, but I think uh, the uh, bottom line here is uh, if you have uh, kids that don't know math or don't, you don't know math yourself, uh, run, don't walk to the nearest uh, Saxon math distributor. Can I can I give our 800 number so people could call us? Please do. It's 1-800-284-7019. And if your child is not doing hacking it in math, they're only going to get one chance to learn it. And my mama realized this, and she saw that I wasn't doing it in school, and so she helped me at home. She bought the materials, and she beat it into me. At, at home, and it's your own flesh and blood, and you have to take care of your own flesh and blood. And if you can't talk to school into trying Saxon math series we have from kindergarten through calculus, then you're going to have to buy the books and teach them at home, or pull them out of school and homeschool them, which is a real hard job. It's a lot easier just to, to augment the math that they learn in school by teaching them the Saxon math at home. Okay, the number again is uh, 1-800-284-7019. Uh, the interesting thing about Saxon math books is that, that you can always resell them at homeschooling conventions after your child has used them. Oh, yes. I'm, I wanted to ask you a question. I'm looking at uh, a graph of the SAT scores in Geronimo, Texas, after, going, after using your program. Uh, the SAT scores have risen in, during this time fr uh, from... And this is the total SAT, verbal plus math, from 766 to 989. But the interesting thing about this graph is that they have uh, broken out the math scores so that you can see the verbal scores, too. And they also are going up. It's my feeling, I mentioned something like this earlier in the interview, and you, uh, you didn't want to take credit for it, but it's my feeling that uh, your uh, math program also improves their performance in non-mathematic subjects because of the discipline it gives to their mind. Well, I teach them how to read for meaning. Yes. This, this is particularly in the in the fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. The word problems. Uh, there, if, if you're reading for meaning, there, there there are certain things that when you read them that should should trigger certain responses, and uh, we we work real hard on this. I don't ever bring that up uh, because that's too difficult for some people to believe. But it, 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 I believe it is true that, that uh, my observations here, this graph I'm looking at on this one school with your things, I think the students uh, are have higher verbal performance because of this math program. Well, now this, this, this I, I just just happen to have this chart 
that you have uh, with Geronimo, Texas, uh, and the uh, uh, I think that it might be possible that a school that is uh, innovative enough to go out and find the Saxon math might be improving in other areas too. Has has possibly gone out and found a good phonics program for teaching reading. I understand. Yes. And and another good program for for teaching English. I, I, I'm very hesitant to to claim. Uh, I didn't expect you to, but I think it's something we should think about because I I think in our home school it's true. I think the kids do better in everything because of the math. It, the, even the, even their uh, the discipline, the uh, because the math is interesting and because it's uh, being uh, uh, taught in this manner, the first thing that in, in, in my experience here, the first thing the student does in the morning is to work his math problems, work his, his math his, his Saxon math lesson. That determines his mindset for the rest of his work in his school room for that day. Or I'll use an example on myself. If I come in in the morning and I start work and the first couple of hours are productive, then there's a much higher probability the rest of the day will be productive even if I have several interruptions. Whereas if the first two hours are unproductive, then I go downhill from there. I think just the fact that they have such a productive uh, and uh, and good experience with the uh, with their math from the Saxon math in the morning, if nothing else gets them out on the, off on the right start uh, intellectually for the rest of the day. Uh, besides whatever real content it may have, they gain confidence. They sit down and they work the problems from your the, the repetitive problems that you mentioned. They learn a little new concept, check all this, and they have the self confidence in their math. Then when they go on, they do better. You're in Oregon. The man who was the math coordinator for the state of Oregon took great pride for for keeping Saxon math books off of the state adopted list in uh, Oregon. He he had a personal campaign to do that. And to my knowledge, the Saxon books are still not on the state adoption list uh, because of the efforts of the last uh, state coordinator of mathematics. Maybe he's part of the reason that I wouldn't let my kids near a public school in this state. I was very disappointed. This has happened in two or three states. It's happened in uh, Tennessee. Uh, let's see, we did an adoption last week in Georgia, uh, and uh, it's it's happened in Georgia. But we've finally gotten to the point now that uh, books in enough schools that when this happens, the states go to the legislature and they change the adoption laws so that good books cannot be blocked just because they don't like the philosophy of the books. You see, the only schools that adopt are the Old South and uh, Oregon. I can name them for you. There's uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, and somehow another Oregon. And then a few of the other states have adoption at the state level, uh, but they they are not uh, they they are not very restrictive. Uh, they they let most of the books on. You know, I don't know if you want to talk about this or not. One of the things I picked up here that's kind of fascinating is the uh, confidence factor that the students get. And uh, from uh, art's perspective, the uh, critical thinking skills that uh, kids get, and yet it would seem the education establishment doesn't recognize the confidence factor or the uh, understanding that kids get uh, when, in fact, that ostensibly is behind a lot of this outcome-based education and whatnot. Yes, uh, they, they don't understand it, and uh, they refuse to accept what's right in front of their eyes. I can't... Uh, I don't think the people are bad people. I don't think they really mean to damage our kids, but they are doing a lot of damage. Do you want to talk about how you uh, created the Saxon Math Program? Now, you've got physics. You're going to be working on chemistry. Can you describe, for the benefit of the listeners, the actual technique you used uh, to build the program? I mean, Because in some ways, now that you have done this work, 
in many ways, ultimately, as time goes by, a lot of uh, so-called math textbooks are going to go by the wayside. How did you actually structure the problems? How did you sit down to write those? <laughs> That's real interesting. Uh, I was uh, teaching a class at the, uh, at the junior college, and I'm a pretty good talker, and I had taught this class. Uh, and I did exceptionally well. It was really good. I was a good lecturer. I had them right in the palm of my hand, and they understood. I could see it in the eyes. And then I got, it was so good that I got through uh, a 60 minute lecture in 20 minutes. And I looked up at the clock and I said, My goodness, I said, <laughs> they would shoot me if I let you out 40 minutes early. And I said, Now let's everybody go, tell you what, let's everybody go to the board and we'll work a couple of these problems, and then I'll let you out 20 minutes early. And so they said, fine. And fortunately, we had blackboards all the way around the room. And just to show how astute I was, uh, I gave them the same problem that I had just worked on the board. And they all copied it on the board. There were 27 of them. I'll never forget that number. And then they copied the problem on the board and stared at it. They didn't have the slightest <laughs> idea what I'd been talking about. <laughs> And so I said, all right. I was really shocked. And I said, now, I'm going to work the problem over here on this board. And don't copy it. If you understand, if you understand what I did, turn around and work the problem yourself. But if you don't understand, signal for a fair catch, and I'll come help you. And uh, 22 of them turned around uh, to try the problem, and five of them signaled for a fair catch. They didn't even understand it the second time. So I sh walked over here and showed how one of them how to do it. I walked him through the problem. Then I looked over there at Marsha, and Marsha had done it, and Jim had, and I said, Marsha, show Jim how to do it. And then I had other people who had worked to show others how to do it. And then I gave them another problem. And in the next 40 minutes, uh, I got every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Jane, and Sally through six problems. And so uh, I went down to my desk and got a cup of coffee and put my feet up on the desk. And I said, John, how did you learn to work math problems? I said, well, I could work them if I'd worked one like it before. And I said, well, how did you learn how to do it the first time? Did you, did you read the book? Can you understand? I said, nobody's ever been able to understand a math book. Did you ask the teacher? I said, the teacher couldn't tell me. I couldn't understand. I said, what, how did you learn how to do it? I said, I'd ask a friend. And I said, what would you ask them? I said, how do you do it? And they, they said, how, how do you get the answer? And, they, and then I said, don't you care about the theory or the concept? I said, no. All I want to do is get the answer. And so they would say, you turn it upside down, take it over here and change the sign on the bottom, and that's the way you do it. And I said, will it work every time? They said, yeah. I said, now do this one. And they do it. And I said, I do this one. And it worked every time. So I would say, okay, uh, then, then this is the way I learned the math. But it was uh, all a set of gimmicks. I didn't learn the proper way to do it until I, uh, until I, until I, started, uh, until I started teaching. And uh, the, uh, so the next day I came back, I came up to class, and I said, all right, now, boys and girls, and we spent, I said, now, let's do this problem again. And I put them to the board again. And about half of them attempted it, and the other half just stood there and looked at the board. They had worked six like it the day before. And so the first day I realized that the only way that they were going to learn how to do it was to do it themselves. And the second day I realized that they couldn't remember what they had done yesterday. So long-term practice, and I finally decided that long-term practice on fundamental concepts was necessary, and so the next fall semester I tried it, and I just started telling them where they learned how to look the problems up in the book, and I gave them homework that was repetitive, and it worked real well, I thought, and at the end of the year, uh, one of the students said, Mr. Saxon, she says, what you have done is better than anything I've ever seen before, but it's still not fair, and I said, why is it not fair? She says, we don't have a book. She says, why don't you write some words so that if we could forget how to do it, we can look at your words and remember how to do it. And if she had said, why don't you write a book 
none of this would have happened. And so I thought that was the most reasonable request, and so I started to write the words uh, for the students to do it. And the first book came up by accident because after I'd done it for the whole semester, I realized I had a manuscript. Now, while I was writing the book, on the first day, I would teach a little of this. And they really didn't understand it. And then so I would give them some practice problems, and I couldn't give them any more on this tomorrow. So I said, what should we do tomorrow? I said, well, I'll let's do a little of that. And so then the night, that night we'd have a little of this and a little of that. And then I said, now what are we going to do the next day? And I said, well, we can't have any more of this and that we, because they've got to practice them for a while before we jack up the level on these. And so I said, well, let's do a little bit some other. And I said, well, when are you going to have some more of this? I said, in about a week. And so I went down and put a little more of this in a week and a little more of that. And if you look in the table of contents, every all the other math books are written in hunks. And it looks like my book is written by a spastic that's, that's, that because there is no continuity in the topics that are discussed in the lessons. Have you found out, Doctor, the, the continuity comes in the homework? And so it it just all happened totally by accident. What a wonderful accident. <laughs> well, it turns out it was, because I figured if something this simple would work, why hadn't somebody thought of it before? And so I was sure that it was wrong, the results I was saying were wrong, because the reasoning behind doing it the way I did it was so was so simple. I said, so surely one of these wonderful math educators would have thought of it before. And they haven't. And, and then what, you mortgaged your house and uh, did all sorts of things, went around Oh, yeah, my mama died and left me 20000 and I had, uh, uh, I knew I could do it. And, of course, everybody who goes bankrupt knows they can do it. <laughs> this is the this is the first idea of going bankrupt is to be bet on a sure thing that you thought of. <laughs> and uh so I I had mortgage uh my mama died and left me twenty thousand and I'd save fifteen, that was thirty five and at that time you could still get money for your house in Oklahoma on a loan because it was during the oil boom and so I went down to the bank and they gave me forty five thousand dollars on my house. And I had a friend who owned a publishing company showed me how to subcontract the book. And I got the book out, and uh, I had 10,000 books in the warehouse and no teacher's edition. And Time Magazine gave me a page and a half two months later. I can't explain some of the things that happened to me without God thinking that God had a hand in it. Uh, the idea that my my I had had two books published by two reviews of my books, uh, two articles by me in National Review that owned, owned by Bill Buckley. And uh, then I called Time Magazine, and I was fortunate enough to get to talk to a researcher. And then uh, they had a story that fell through, and uh, they had to have a story. And this researcher says, well, I have this story about this man in Oklahoma. And so Time Magazine ran the book, ran the thing. Uh, I, my first book came out in October. Time Magazine gave me a page and a half on December the 21st, 1981. My book had been out for two months. And so I sold on the basis of the Time Magazine. Everybody was so desperate to find something that worked. 25,000 books the next year to get my house back. And then I started writing books frantically. And I don't know, I still don't know what I'm doing. But I know that I couldn't learn it the way I was taught, and that I really didn't care about the math anyhow, and that if they didn't have me do long-term practice, I wouldn't remember. Much of the math that I know, I took so many math courses, and about the third time that something came up, I said, shoot, that must be important. I said, I had it in the last course, and I had it in the course before that. They must want me to know that. <laughs> Well, I always maintain that being bright is, in essence, uh, figuring out uh, that something is important after they've told it to you several times. Well, <laughs> my my life has been a history of not listening to what people say, and so it's 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 really amazing uh, that that I was uh, able to do what I have done uh, because uh, nothing else I have ever done has really succeeded.
succeeded before. I didn't graduate from MIT. I'm talking to this MIT grad. I mean, this Caltech graduate here who has spoken to Richard Feynman, and I, I am just awed. I, I don't even know anybody who has. You're the first person I've ever met that's ever spoken to Richard Feynman. Now there's thousands of such people. You you uh, uh, are describing uh, a uh, an idea which or a, a a methodology which is well known in advanced science. If you uh, if, if you're, for example, a physicist and you decide you want to attack a problem in biology or a chemist or something, uh, typically a scientist can't make a lot of progress in his own field because uh, he thinks just the way all the other hundreds or thousands of people in the same field think, and it takes something unusual like a... Isn't that, isn't that strange? He, but, I, I don't think Watson yeah. was a, a biologist, was he? I don't. Watson and Crick? Well, they were. That's an unusual story. But let me finish this. Go ahead. Uh, but when a field, when a scientist changes fields or goes into a field that he isn't trained in, he's likely to see things that the people in that field don't see. And there's one rule that uh, that is very good in this, and that is don't read anything in that field until you've thought about it a lot yourself. Otherwise, you'll think just like the rest of them. In your uh, your experience, you, you you weren't trained to do to make all the mistakes that the math educators were making because you weren't paying attention to them, and that's why you succeeded. I sort of figured that out. I said I wasn't trained in the field, and I didn't know what the proper thought processes were. And when I started teaching math at age 50, I said, this doesn't make any sense at all. Had you been well trained, you couldn't have done this because you would have been well trained in all of their mistakes. Well, that's why you. Observation. That's why you've made such a wonderful success of this. Uh, you talk about Feynman. He did the same kind of thing. He liked to go down and play with problems in biology, and I'm sure he didn't read the literature first. <laughs> well, one of the things that I got from Feynman, his 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 books were were, were really. I mean, much of his work, those lectures he did uh, for Caltech freshmen. They were really physics lectures. Well, yeah, they they were they were big time physics. But the thing that I admired about Richard by reading Richard Feynman when I didn't understand a lot of the things, he did not think physics was sacred. He did not think you had to speak the sacred language. And when he, I remember the time when he said that, uh, well, that if light comes straight to you, and if it can find another path uh, that will allow the light to uh, get to you in the same length of time, it will take both paths. And the uh, that is the way he explained mirages, and that the light can go straight to you and you can see it, And but it, if it goes down on the highway, the light travels faster in the in the in the hot atmosphere and it can take the curved path down and get to you at the same time and you will see both of them and it's and, and Feynman says now how does light know which uh, of these other paths to take he says does it smell them out and he said well sort of and then he went on for the official explanation and as soon as he said that light smelled out these other paths I could understand that. That's country boy talk. And he did a lot of that in his breakthrough thoughts in physics. It, it sounds to me like uh, what the average uh, parent, average uh, child can pick up a Saxon math book and uh, virtually guarantee himself by the end of uh, high school that uh, he'll be functional in math. No. He can't pick up the book. The parent, I, I disagree with you on this. I believe the parent has to be in there with the child. I don't think it's right to ask. If they had asked my mother, with my attitude, had asked me to take a Saxon math book and work through it, I would not have done it. Okay. I had a, I had a, she bought me a lovely desk to study at. And I would go in and I would put my work I was supposed to be studying uh, on the top of the desk, and I would put the novel I was reading in the drawer. And I had very good hearing, and as soon as I heard the door start to open behind me, I would 
carefully slide the drawer shut, and there, for all intents and purposes, was her young son, John, studiously studying. <laughs> well, she should have stayed in the room with you and gotten that. Well, yes. Well, she would have done a lot better if she had done that, but she felt that she ought to trust me, and she shouldn't have trusted me any further than she could throw me. It was these five, six children here that have either gone through or are going through your math program. Well, it sounds like somebody is there with them in the morning. Oh, no, that's, there's, there's an additional parameter. My desk is in the same room, and I work there. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You just can't give the books to the kids. But they might read something that's very evident to the mother or the father, uh, who, who has the same level of math expertise that they have, and uh, they would not be evident to the child. They, they they have got to be helped. I, well, now wait. The help I give them is that I work in the same room and set an example. I never help them with the problems. Well, uh, you, you, I can just tell you, your children are probably as unusual as you are no, because I, there are very few people who have cut the mustard at Caltech. No, I don't, I don't think they're that unusual. We've had, the, now, in one case, uh, the one little boy reminds me of the experience you talked about for yourself. The other five, when I sat them down, they just did what their brothers and sisters did. They kept went, started working problems. Well, I think possibly because their brothers and sisters were there, that might have helped them a little bit. Yeah, all the peer pressure helps. But if you disagree with me entirely, I will just restate the fact that it's so wonderful that we live in a free country and we can believe opposite things. Yeah. Because I, I did this thing from my root, and how I ever got through the math and, <laughs> and and was able to do this will always be a mystery to me. But this last little boy I was going to mention, uh, not the last one in age, but one little boy, didn't do that. He did about what you describe in yourself. He sat there and looked at the book. Now, he couldn't have the novel in the desk because he wouldn't have got away with that. I was in the room. Mm -hmm. He stared at the book for a couple of months before he started. Eventually, he decided, well, he's going to sit there. He might as well work the problems. That's true. <laughs> Let me ask, we're just about out of time here, uh, Art and John. Uh, John, of people who are sympathetic uh, to uh, the Saxon Math Program, what is their uh, chief criticism? Is, do they criticize it uh, for time or uh, drudgery? And any chief criticism you get from your sympathizers? The, the people who use my book, 99% of them, are so thrilled with what their students are learning, they have never seen it happen before. And the gains are so extreme uh, that if they have any uh, small uh, doubts, uh, they don't voice them. They, they, they just overjoyed with what they have seen. My, bi my big critics are the critics who have never used the books uh, and, and are who a teacher who will walk in the room, say a ninth grade math room, and say, "All right, now get your get your uh, book out and do your lesson," and they won't do it. They've got to be helped. Uh, the only way, if the child works all of the problems in one of my books, then he knows everything that I want him to know. If he can find a way of skipping problems or skipping lessons or not working all the problems, he isn't going to learn very much at all. Art, we have about four minutes. Any uh, parting uh, questions here? No. Well, John Saxon, I, I want to say personal thanks uh, for your work. Uh, we use uh, Saxon Math in uh, my home school, and I know uh, Art feels the same way. We're grateful for uh, your work. We trust that uh, God will uh, bless you for that and uh, trust that... Uh, Thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people will uh, get turned on to the Saxon Math Program. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It, it's not going to go away. I'd like to thank you on behalf of my family, too. You've made a great difference here. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Well, our uh, very fascinating interview, uh, fascinating man. It, it would seem that this man has the possibility of changing the uh, face of mathematics knowledge in the country. Well, he's provided a tool. And uh, the, uh, it's up to the rest of us to see that his tool is used. Your belief is that most children, if uh, given uh, parental encouragement and maybe, I should say, intolerance of deviation from the path... You, you saw that little difference we were having. And I think the difference is, 
we, we didn't have time to talk about it, but he, he probably might agree. I think the difference uh, is because he is looking at the children in the schools in the country as they are, and his method can change the amount of math they're learning. Well, not just the amount. It can change the whole fundamentals of their education. But he's thinking of them as they are. When I think about them, I think of them in a home school the way I think they should be. But most of them aren't that way yet. So you could say, I mean, I, it'd be fine for me to say, well, I got six kids to sit down, and they did their math, and they had to do that. They didn't know any better, and I wouldn't let them out of it if they had complained. On the other hand, if you sent ten kids from the public schools in here, uh, who knows what they would do. Uh, he's saying that the child needs someone working with them. I think he's probably right about the vast majority of public school students or students in our society who are saturated with television and saturated with all kinds of other influences which distract them from their work. So I, I tend to think that the, the, the idea that the child complete, completely self-teach is tied up with the environment in which he is. Most children in the United States aren't in that environment, and it's those children that Saxon, quite rightly, is most concerned about. So when he says, he, the way he found them when he was teaching and the way he finds most of the kids that are that are using his books, that they uh, need more individual attention, I, I, I'm sure he's right. I would say that's because of other influences in their environment that it would be well to get rid of as well. You see what I mean? You basically are actually agreeing, even though it uh, sounded on the service there like there was a disagreement. Yeah, I, I don't think, well, I mean, he, he'd, he'd, I'm sure he'd be happy to have a child sit down and go through the Max Saxon Mass <laughs> series without help, uh, but it's his experience that lots of kids need uh, someone sitting beside them. I don't think that's good for them. But I would agree that most kids, in the way you find them in society today, would. Oh, all right. Uh, the other thing which I we didn't talk about, but I uh, noticed he he said, well, you could just leave the kids in the school, but give them the sacks of math, and that would patch up that problem. Uh, I think it's better to take them out of the school and not have the problem in the first place. Uh, it's n no doubt correct that if you teach sacks of math on the side in your home and the child has to stay up late at night and so forth to try to learn what he didn't learn in the school that he probably can learn it eventually. He'd be better off not to give him the disadvantage of having to start that way. Start him off in the morning with the right thing. And uh, I'm not uh, don't, don't fool with the, the bad influences. Well, this is a remarkable man. He's done a remarkable thing, and it's, it's, as you say, very simple. I don't think that he's the first one that's ever had these thoughts. My guess is that... Uh, Good teachers uh, centuries ago realized this too, but these big organizations, like the huge uh, socialized medicine system in the United States, and this organization has given him trouble. These math teachers are just part of socialized education. Uh, these big organizations can drift off in, into the craziest of holes, and they've drifted so far away from fundamentals that a man like this can come in and say, "Hey, wait a minute! Two plus two is four, guys." And he's totally right, and they just look they just look incompetent <laughs> because they their crowd has <laughs> has thundered off in the wrong direction so long that they don't even remember the fundamentals. Yeah, the uh, re the research is just incredible. I, I mean, he's had success after success. Uh, more kids want to do math. These things you can't show it on the radio interview uh, uh, very well, but these. Uh, uh, these test scores from school after school after school that have taken his program uh, are just astonishing. But they're not little effects. Like here, the one I was talking about, Geronimo, Texas, they start out uh, with an average uh, college board score of 766. Three years later, they're at 989. And uh, he, there are a lot of different things, not just the SATs used in here, all these other different sorts of tests. But... Uh, you know, find a, it, it's just uh, these are not little effects. These are overwhelming, huge <laughs> effects. And as he said, uh, the establishment uh, uh, socialized uh, education people, there's nothing they can do. They admit that the scores go up that much. They just say, well, there's something else there that we're teaching and you're not testing it. 
<laughs> like, like, uh, I if you visited a public school recently, what they are teaching is probably not what you want your kids to know. But here, uh, here's another uh, thing. Uh, just the math score. Now, the other one I mentioned was the uh, verbal plus math. Uh, Switch City, Indiana. They start out with a ma- average math score is at 398. Two years later, they're at 504. Wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, 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 just exa- here's one, Belleville, Illinois. These guys start out with 478 as their average math scores, the, uh, SAT math scores. And let's see, this is uh, four years, four to five years later, the 478 has become 630. You, you know, the only way that you could overlook something like that is if you didn't have a background in math. Well, you, you realize the difference here is the difference between the. The score you would get, you would need to get into a probably the poorest university in the country, and the kind of score you need to get into a top university. Mm. There are a few places in the country you'd need a 700, but that's rare. And there's a note on the bottom of this thing: these these bars average things out. In 1992, this school, which started with a 478, in 1992 their average was 730. Wow. It's just stunning, and for people who aren't used to this, uh, 800 is a perfect score. 730 is above the average of every university in this country. Good. Uh, right. And it's just, uh, here's another one, 415 to 575. Uh, the, the results are overwhelming. And the same thing with the other test types that they use. He's got a bunch, there are a bunch of them where they've, they use ACT tests and other tests that are used by any by all measures, uh, this math program has outstripped everything that the establishment is using and, and it has outstripped it overwhelmingly. You don't even need to talk about statistical significance because it's, the, the results are so large that, uh, that I mean, they're certainly significant, but they're, <laughs> they're way beyond any, any even discussion of that. One area we didn't get into, and, and I don't know, and I think John was trying to say this as well, there is really no way to quantify this, is is there a spillover effect into uh, other areas? Well, yeah, I'm sure there is. He, uh, and he uh, uh, kind of admitted there might be, but he's in a position that, uh, I mean, he knows, he's, he's well known. Uh, this tape is going to be distributed widely. He has enough trouble with these uh, these socialists uh, not paying attention to his math achievement and to uh, start to talk about the other effects of Saxon math would just be, uh, if he were to make a statement like that uh, strongly, then he'd be widely criticized on that. These fellows would attack him for that statement and try to make everybody forget about the college board scores in math. Yeah. So it's, it's wise for him not to... Uh, uh, not to discuss these other things or to give them too much credence, but I know they're there. I watch them with these kids. And as I say, I, while we were talking, I looked at this Geronimo, Texas thing, and it was the only graph in, in these many uh, uh, graphs of, of SAT scores as a function of uh, Saxon math in this uh, book that I'm looking at, in which they happen to have written down the math scores uh, separately so I could break them out and, and fit in the verbal scores. And he's right. The school may be just advanced in many ways, and they were pushing up the verbal scores some other way. But as I said on the tape, uh, if you get a good start in the morning, if you do nothing but get a good intellectual start in the morning, you'll do better all day. Yeah. And there's no better start you can give a kid than a set of Saxon math problems. Okay, the uh, Saxon math number, if you missed it, 1-800-284-7019, 800-284-7019. Dr. Arthur Robinson, the uh, director of the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine. Uh, Dr. Robinson, why don't you give the Institute's address if uh, folks uh, don't have your address? Oh, well, the address is 2251 Dick George Road, Cave Junction, Oregon, 97523. 